you guys are having a seat, you can turn to Exodus. Surprise, surprise. We are going to be in Exodus chapter 30 and chapter 31. Um, we are right before chapter 32 when things start getting a little uh, tense when it comes to the people of Israel and the presence of God. But until we get there, which this week will be... Um, the transition week before we get to chapter 32, there's still two pieces of the puzzle that I would like to talk about and discuss and get you guys to talk about and discuss within the context of your community groups regarding the subject of worship. As you know, chapters 25 through chapters 31 of the book of Exodus, the, the absolute theme that runs through all of those chapters, and then we talked about runs through the entire book of Leviticus, and runs through the first 10 chapters of Numbers, is the theme and the perspective of worship. And so as you begin to think through your own means of worship, your own ability to engage in the presence of God throughout your life, not just through traditional means, not just through liturgy, not just through church, not just through music, but through friends and relationships and your vocation and creation and how you worship alone, there are aspects to all of those certain things. And as we talked about each one of the pieces of furniture that were part of the tabernacle, the actual construction of the tabernacle, that there was purposeful intentionality when it came to Yahweh giving Moses his design. How would it draw people near to him? How would it draw people to a worshipful posture towards him? And so as we move in kind of putting a conclusion or ending parentheses on this topic of worship before we get into chapter 32, there are two more things to discuss, and in the title are found those two things, the joy of Sabbath and an opportunity of prayer or for prayer. What does it mean to enjoy Sabbath? And we're going to get there. That's actually the second part of the message. And the first part is this, that you and I have this incredible opportunity as children of the living God to actually communicate with Yahweh. That we have the privilege of having an ability, an opportunity to pray. We all want an opportunity to converse with those with whom we are most intimate. When we're away from our children, we want the opportunity to talk to our children. Part of the things that you have to iron out when grandparents become grandparents and your kids are your kids and they still think that your kids are their kids even though really they're not. They're my kids and you get to hang out with them and have fun with them. And you know, there's all this, that, and the other. But part of learning to be a quality grandparent parent is learning to let your grandchildren talk to their parents when they need to talk to their parents. That's just part of the intimacy of the relationship. And as you think through that intimacy, when your wife is gone, or when your husband's gone, or when your best friend moves out of town, or when someone that you really care about is serving overseas in their vocation, or in God's heart for the nations, or doing both together, there's just something really cool about the technology of the day that you get to use Skype, or use FaceTime, or use whatever, and see them. That you have this opportunity to be intimate with the people that you're closest with, and so why would we not? Jump up and down, wait in joyful anticipation to meet with the living God, to experience Him, to enjoy Him, and to enjoy Him through a conversation. Not just by being alone, not just by walking outside and looking at the beautiful mountains, not just by the, the gorgeous creativity of music or of art, but conversation. What is prayer and how do we move towards prayer. We're going to look at chapter 30, verses 1 through 10, and also verses 34 through 37. That will get us jump started toward the topic of prayer. So starting in chapter 30, verse 1 through verse 10 is where we will be reading. You shall make an altar on which to burn incense. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its breadth. It shall be square, and two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. You shall overlay it with pure gold, its top 
and around its sides and its horns, and you shall make a molding of gold around it, and you shall make two golden rings for it. Under its molding, on two opposite sides of it, you shall make them, and they shall be holders for poles with which to carry it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and you shall put it in front of the veil that is above the ark of the testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is above the testimony, where I will meet with you. And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he shall burn it. A regular incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer unauthorized incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a grain offering, and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. He shall make atonement for it once in the year throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. And then if you skip over to verse 34. Chapter 30, verse 34. The Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, sacti and anica. Because that's what it sounds like, right? And galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each shall there be an equal part. And make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very small and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I shall meet with you. It shall be most holy for you. And the incense that you shall make according to its composition, you shall not make for yourselves. It shall be for you, holy to the Lord. As we get into this description of the altar of incense, the, the questions that begin to flood my mind as I read this is, what's the deal with incense? And right before the incense, or excuse me, right after the incense, yes, Right before verse 34, you have the anointing of oil. And so oil is brought into that. We're not going to highlight oil. All that is to say is that it was part of the washing ceremony of getting the priests prepared for purity. And so as you think through that, just think about, okay, I'm going to read through this, and that's what oil is about. But we're talking about incense. And in the biblical world... As you read these two sections of chapter 30, there is a strong symbol of prayer that is associated with incense. Incense equals the metaphor of the prayer of God's people. And so as you begin to think about this theme of incense and prayer and the altar and where the altar is located and all of those things that we're going to talk about in just a second, Remind yourself that as incense is spoken of in Scripture, it is to highlight prayer. Psalm chapter 141 verse 2 says this, Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Luke chapter 1 verse 10 says, And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside, at the hour of incense, at the hour of prayer. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are what? The prayers of the saints. Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Again, you get beautiful imagery. And you know, when we read Revelation in and of itself, by itself, alone, in its own little room, we get really confused. And Revelation is a confusing book. And so I will be the first one to say I definitely do not understand all of it. But isn't it kind of fun to read these 
few verses, and as you read more of Revelation, it starts to make sense. We've spoken of several passages in Revelation because it relates to what God has been doing, even through the imagery of the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle and how the people worshipped. I mean, when you read Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, you get an image of the altar of incense covered in gold burning of incense. There's this beautiful imagery that connects all of Scripture. Revelation is easier to understand if you connect it throughout all of Scripture. I think that's the beauty and the, and the preservation and the perseverance of people who try to disprove Scripture, that it is such a whole and complete book of God's Word. Perspective is everything. If incense is, in fact, prayer, then how do we gain perspective? Well, we gain perspective from yet another passage of Scripture, which is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. Again, remember the point of the tabernacle. Remember the point of Yahweh being present as He stood on the mercy seat which covered the Ark of the Covenant to meet in the Holy of Holies with the High Priest to continue to move his people onto his agenda in the direction that he wanted them to go. Think of that image. Think of that picture. Think of the detail that God gave Moses. And then read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, because we gain perspective. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things. Understand it. The tabernacle was a copy of what is already present in heaven. God is present in heaven. God rules in his fullness throughout all of eternity, but his presence is in heaven. His residence is there which are copies of the true things, but, but Christ enters into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. Why? Why is Jesus there? He appears in the presence of God for our behalf, on our behalf. Jesus is the intermediator. He's the person that stands before our sin and says, I will take it on myself so that you can continue to enjoy God's creation and desire and intimacy that he planned from the beginning with you. And so we gain perspective of this intercession, of this mediator, as we think about prayer and incense, and then we get some practical insight in just reading these two sections in chapter 30. The practicalness of it is we find out the location. We've learned that as you walk into the courtyard, there's another altar made of bronze, and we <laughs> refer to that altar made of bronze as what? A giant grill. Some of you have said that you have, your mind's been blown the last few weeks to just picture God's house with a giant grill, and uh, that's what it was, a giant grill. And as you enter into that, the tent is open during the day and closed at night, and inside the first room of two rooms in the tabernacle, you have the table with the bread of presence, and then from there, what separates the bread of presence on the table with the lamps and the lampstands is the most holy of holies, which is the other room, which is where the Ark of the Covenant is. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant is the seat, the atonement seat, the mercy seat, where God would meet with his people. And between, right in front of the curtain, before you would move past into the holy of holies, the location of the altar of incense is right there, placed right in front of the curtain that was before the ark. We learn very clearly and practically in verse 8 of chapter 30 that Aaron was given instructions when you tend to the lamps in the morning and in the evening that you should also tend to the altar of incense that the incense should be a regular offering. There's practicality in there. We referred last week to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. There's a concept in here that morning and evening without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians tells us to rejoice always. It tells us to 
pray without ceasing. It tells us to give thanks in all circumstances. And so again, God is giving us a shadow of things to come that as we reflect on incense that never ceases to offer up the prayers of God's people to his holy throne, it is a shadow of saying to us in all things, to the joy and the presence of the Holy Spirit and the sacrifice and the intercession of Jesus on our behalf, always be thankful. Never stop rejoicing. Allow your prayers to be as frequent as the incense that burned in the tabernacle. Again, there's practicality. And then we read in verses 34 through 37 of chapter 30 some more practical insight. It gave a description of what were the spices that were used to develop the um, incense. And we're not exactly familiar. Many scholars have tried to exactly pinpoint what are these specific spices that are mentioned. And they're not exactly sure which spices are until it gets to frankincense. And there's other places in scripture that frankincense is used. But guess what? This is the first time in the biblical record that the spice frankincense is mentioned. So it's not an accident that as God establishes his house, one of the gifts that are given to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior that is born in a manger is frankincense. Connection. A beautiful portrayal of God's investment in his people. But one very peculiar thing is it mentions all the spices. God tells Moses as he gives instruction, and I love this, if you don't think your vocation is important, read verses 34 through 37 again. And in fact, you can read many sections of chapter 30 because, or excuse me, of chapter 31. We're not going to get there tonight, but you read about Bazael and Ophaliah. And as you read about them, these guys took their vocation seriously, and they were chosen by God to build, to construct all of the things that we've been talking about through these chapters of worship. Their vocation was important, and yet another vocation is mentioned when it comes to incense, and what is it? A perfumer. Interesting. That in something so, quote-unquote, insignificant as a perfumer, God specifically gives Moses instructions not to do it himself. He doesn't say, hey Moses, take this spice, this spice, this spice, pour a cup of this, a teaspoon of this, tablespoon of this, mix it all up, pour some salt in it, you're good. No, he says, get the professional. Get the one with experience. Get the one who knows how to mix things and mix my incense for me. It's a beautiful display that God loves the details of your life. God loves the details. He loves that you're passionate about coffee. He loves that you're passionate about cooking. He loves that you're passionate about detailing your car. He loves that you're passionate about whatever it is that you're passionate about. Now, some of you have heard some of the things that I'm passionate about. But what does it look like for you to just leap with joy because you have this odd ability to fill in the blank. God sees the details and he uses the joy and the nuances of his people to accomplish his purposes. And we see that in the practicality of the incense. But back to the salt. So there's all these herbs and spices that are mixed together to create an incense. But then God says to put salt in it. Why? Why use salt? Well, again, not only in the ancient world, but also throughout Scripture, salt is a, is a strong picture. It is a strong metaphor of what God wants us to be. He tells us to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. And so what is it about salt? Well, there's two things that we can relate as it speaks specifically in verses 34 through 37. The phrase of salt, when you see that in Scripture, of salt, you can transpose of salt into another word, which is the word permanent. Of salt brings its permanence to light. So if we are to be the salt of the earth, what are we to establish? The permanence of God's presence in our lives. God has established his 
His excellent glory in who we are. And so what does it mean for us to be the salt of the earth? There's other implications, but permanence can be filled in from of salt. And then it gives two descriptions. It says purity. Salt is related to purity. You see salt preserved freshness. That's why you have beef jerky. So meat dries and it's kind of salty. And the salt allows the meat to cure. So before refrigeration, we won't get into the detail, but you packed things with salt. And the reason you packed things with salt was so that they would stay fresh, so that you could eat them later because there was no refrigeration. So salt preserved freshness, which means, practically, it preserved the spices. It allowed the spices to simply not go rancid, not spoil. They didn't keep a little small fridge by the curtain of the tabernacle that they could bring the incense out. They had to cure it with salt. So salt, as you read through scripture, gives a purity element. You are to be the salt of the earth. Implications. Permanence. Implications. The purity of God among all of creation. And then you have, as I've already described, permanence. But the permanence of salt as we relate to the Old Covenant, as we relate to the building of the tabernacle, it represented what? The completeness of God's covenant. The permanence of God's covenant. It reminded the people of chapter 25, we are going to seal this covenant. It is permanent. And morning through evening, without ceasing, as the incense is offered, as the prayers of God's people in the house of God, it is again representing what? The covenant. What does the ark represent? The covenant. What does the salt represent? The covenant. What does the altar represent? The covenant. What does Jesus represent? The covenant. I think you're getting the picture. God allows his people to see the importance of what he's trying to develop in and throughout Scripture. So as you read about incense and as you relate it to prayer, ask yourself some of these questions. Does your time spent in prayer reflect an eternal gratefulness and dependence on Jesus? Does your time spent in prayer Reflect an eternal gratefulness and dependence on Jesus. How do you, practically speaking, portray the purity of a Christ follower? How do people, when they look at your life, say, Oh wow, I'm not exactly sure all the details, but they are different. There's something more pure about who they are. And then when you say, Well, I'm a follower of Jesus, they begin to identify it. How do you portray the purity of a Christ follower in the urgency of your prayers? One of the things that I talked about last week, and it's been some of the buzz around some of the community groups, is utilizing, this is John Piper's metaphor, it's his illustration of what is prayer for. Prayer is, we understand what prayer is for when we understand that prayer is war. It's engaging in the act of warfare in the spiritual realm. And so we need to understand prayer as a wartime walkie-talkie, not as a vacation Skype interview. But what does it look like to really engage in prayer constantly? And as you think about your life, how do you portray the purity of Christ in the urgency of your prayers? Now, you can evaluate that, and some of you are going to be harder on yourselves than others, but the purpose is, how do we embrace a lifestyle of prayer? Well, I think there's some things that prevent us from embracing a lifestyle of prayer. And I think before we get into the question, why is prayer such a struggle, I think we must settle this statement. The greater the burden, the more intense your prayers will be. There have been some pretty intense times of prayer in my life. But as I think about when those times of prayer were most 
vibrant and delicate and intense, it's because I was burdened greatly by what I was praying for. When Angel and I spent time overseas and praying for the people and watching people in their own idolatry, I remember intense times of prayer. When I was praying for Esther and the adoption process, there were intense times of prayer. When Morgan and Kara were born earlier than they should have been born as twins, there were intense times of prayer. When Angel and I moved with a group of ten people to come to Tucson and to start Second Mile, there were intense times of prayer. When Josie was born and our church came together for the DeSotos, I can remember intense times of prayer. As I think about relationships that have gone good and gone bad in the context of Second Mile, in my own heart there have been intense times of prayer. You see, the things that weigh on us the most move us towards an intensity of prayer. And so as you think about that subject, then allow yourself to ask the question, why is prayer such a struggle? I will also be the first one to admit that prayer I do not have figured out. I have been around men who are seasoned and wise when it comes to the intensity and the urgency and the discipline and the perseverance and the consistency of prayer. I've talked to guys who were not bragging. They were people that were probably as humble as I have ever been around, saying that they had set aside 24 hours to pray, and they began to become very frustrated that at hour 20, they started to get distracted. And I think, man, in minute two. <laughs> right? I mean, how and why and for what is prayer to be about, and why do we struggle? I think we struggle for four reasons, and you can wrestle through this, and you can discuss this with your spouse, or your community group, or your friends, but I think the first thing in struggling to pray is we must move past our sin. You see, I think our sin stymies us. We, we begin to convince ourselves that we are unworthy to have a conversation with God. Part of the men's retreat, we spent a lot of time declaring this truth about our relationship with God. If you, in fact, are a child of God, God cannot, He is incapable of loving you more or less tomorrow than He does love you more or less today. God loves you. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter the stupid decision that you will make tomorrow. God loves you. And so we struggle to enter into a conversation with prayer because we've convinced ourselves that God doesn't want to hear. We've convinced ourselves that there's something so wrong with me that God won't listen. And yet God is asking us to be convinced of the power of the cross. To be convinced of the power of atonement. To be convinced of the power not to sin with license, but when we do sin, to get on our knees and to ask for forgiveness. Psalm chapter 66, verse 18 says this, If I had cherished iniquity in my, excuse me, iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So if you just continue to move towards this rebellion, if you just continue to say, well, it doesn't matter, if you continue to allow the enemy and your own sinful flesh to, to convince you that God doesn't want to hear, if you take the wrong part of the message of that passage, then you will find yourself paralyzed. But if you read the whole counsel of Scripture, and if you learn that says about Scripture that says, hey, if we repent, when we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God says in the book of Acts, repent now and turn back to God so that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Allow your prayers, if things are becoming a roadblock for you to have a conversation with God, 
Don't allow Psalm 66, 18 to be the truth consistency, consistently in your life. Allow repentance to come in so that you can have a conversation with God. Not only must we move past our sin, we must move past our unbelief. Mark chapter 9, verses 23 through 24 says this, And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. If you read all of that passage in Mark chapter 9, the man's son is being demonized. And so God is looking to the dad, and this is what he says. If you can, all things are possible. Your son is tormented. Your son has not found healing. But if you believe, it is possible. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. Last week we ended the gathering with this whole concept of faith versus sight. What, is, what does it mean to be a person who believes God even though you may not see tangibly the things of God? What does it mean to be okay with not having to adopt the rationale of I'll believe when you prove it? What does it mean to move with our relationship with Jesus and always have faith as part of the puzzle? That's not to mean that we don't need to be theologically deep. That's not to mean that we don't need to be intelligently broad. But it does mean that our faith will never have, quote unquote, all the answers. It's not meant to. Because we're not meant to have all the answers. Only God himself has all the answers. We must move past our sin. We must move past our unbelief. And why do we struggle in prayer? We must act despite the many distractions. I already talked about my own distractions and my own persevering through prayer. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 says this, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of what? Your prayers. I don't know about you, but when I watch the world news, I think I go back to 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. Now, I'm not saying that the end of the world is going to happen tomorrow, but I am saying that the earth is moaning for Jesus to return. Governments are moaning for Jesus to return. The church is moaning for Jesus to return. And if the end is to be near, then what are we to do? We are to be self-controlled and sober-minded. Why? For the sake of prayer. Have you watched the news about Syria and have you prayed for the Syrians? When you watch about genocide, do you pray for genocide? Do you pray against it? Do you pray that God would reveal himself among the people that are so absent from his presence? When you see the conflict in our own city over government decisions, over health care, over whatever, are you more in tune to argue about policies? Or are you more in tune to pray for God's grace? How do we become people who are self-controlled and sober-minded so that we can be people of prayer. Why is prayer such a struggle? The last one, we must be aware of the spiritual battle. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Guys, heaven is real. Hell is real. And there is a battle for the souls of humanity. Our flesh is involved. The enemy is involved. Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God the Father are involved. The angels of heaven are involved. And what do we as God's people do to engage 
in this spiritual battle? How do we find the tension? How do we not claim that there's a demon under every seat, and yet at the same time engage in a manner of prayer that engages the Spirit of God to break through the darkness that is in our city? It's an intense time for us as God's people as we reflect on the incense that was regularly morning and evening lifted up to represent the prayer of the saints of God's people to come together as his people and to pray. How will you pray? The question to kind of end this section of prayer is this. Which area is your most consistent hurdle when it comes to the discipline of prayer? Is it the sin hurdle? Is it the unbelief hurdle? Is it the distractions hurdle? Is it the spiritual battle hurdle? And how will you practically develop habits to overcome the hurdle? You see, the Christian life is not about walking onto a racetrack and seeing hurdles. And I don't know if you guys have actually seen hurdles, like the legit hurdles. They, they are really tall. Like, really tall. And I can walk onto a track and look at a hurdle, and I can immediately say, no, thank you. I will bust my face, and it will look like that asphalt. That's what it will look like, because there's no way I can jump over that. And you see, we have done that exact thing when it comes to our spiritual lives. We walk onto this thing that's called life, and we see the obstacles that are very evident in and through our lives, and instead of drawing close to the presence of God, and instead of asking God to discipline us, not in a bad way, not in a negative way, but to train us, to allow us to engage in the spiritual endeavor that he's asking us to engage in, we just walk away and claim Christianity to be something else. And God is asking us to look at the hurdle, and to look at the presence of the Holy Spirit, and to rip off everything that so easily entangles us and jump the hurdle. Persevere. Run the race. Beat your body and make it your slave. How do we engage in what God wants us to engage in? How do we overcome that hurdle? What I'd like for you to do is... Um, at this time, you may need to be reminded of praying for the city. We're going to do this several times throughout the summer and throughout the next semester as we are highlighting the different parts of prayer and fasting. I want you to grab one or two other people. Um, if you're uncomfortable, you can do it by yourself. That's quite all right. And grab the prayer points. Um, you can, If you have the week of prayer thing, you can look at day three, which is Wednesday, the city of Tucson. You can pray for seeds. You can pray for the city of Tucson. The thing that's back there is you have a unique story. God has worked in your life in very specific ways. Pause, reflect, and celebrate with prayers of thankfulness. You also have a very, very unique sphere of influence. You as the perf perfumer, that unique vocation, it's not an accident that you work where you work or live where you live or go to school where you go to school or work out where you work out, or have coffee where you have coffee. Your kids are friends with the people that they are friends with, not by accident. You volunteer where you volunteer, not by accident. So spend the next three to five minutes with one or two other people and pray for our city. Ready? Go. God, I ask that as we think about our city, that you would allow us to really identify the hurdles in our city that prevent us from praying. That as we think about just the depth of lostness, as we read a statistic that says 90% of the people in this area don't go to church anywhere, I'm going to pray that we would be a people that overcome what seems overwhelming that we would see the strength of your presence, of your sovereignty, of your power, of your desire to bring healing and salvation, not only to the city, but to the ends of the earth. God, I pray that we would be a people that within 
ourselves and within our families and within our community groups and within our neighborhoods that we would be a people who pray. A people that never stop conversing with a holy and righteous and intimate God. God, I thank you for seeds and I thank you for the vision that you've given us in seeds. I thank you that we are seeing really awesome things happening and thank you for the people who are getting involved. God, I pray that we would continue to build a solid foundation so that seeds would have longevity, so that seeds would have a constant, permanent, and pure presence in this city to reach people with the glory of the gospel. God, I pray that you would give each one of us insight through our own unique roles, our gifts, our talents, our jobs, our friendships, our passions, that you would give us insight in how to talk about our relationship with you with those around us. We love you, and it's in your name that we ask these things. Amen. The next part is in chapter 31, starting in verse 12. We move from the topic of prayer to the topic of the Sabbath. And in chapter 31 of verse 12, it says this, And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. I think oftentimes we just don't understand Sabbath. We just don't understand why is God so intense. When you read that three different times, it said death, cut off, death. I mean, what is the deal with the importance of Sabbath? What, why is the topic, I think, is another question that comes to our mind, brought up again in chapter 31, when it was already thoroughly discussed in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, when God really talks to Moses about the Ten Commandments, one of them being keeping the Sabbath. Well, I think as you think through the concept of Sabbath and then think through why is it mentioned throughout Scripture multiple times, we have to be reminded again why are chapters 25 through 31 in the book of Exodus? What is the theme? The theme is worship. So as God is trying to get his people to identify him through the discipline of worship, he brings up once again Sabbath. You see, as worship is the theme of this section, corporate worship was a weekly occurrence that took place when? On the Sabbath. And if the Sabbath wasn't properly observed, worship could not properly take place. The point of the Sabbath within the book of Exodus is worship. Is God's people taking a break, resting, and coming together for His glory? So what are the essentials to Sabbath? As you read, I would, I would encourage you to make a note, to mark it. You can go and read it right now. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. You're going to see the terminology almost exactly the same as I walk through what is the Sabbath in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 and 11. It starts like this. Remember the Sabbath. So when it comes to what is the Sabbath, the first thing that we have to remind ourselves is that the Sabbath literally means, literally, rest. 
That's what it means to take a day off. Remember whom and what you trust. Do you trust your work ethic? Do you trust your ability to get things done? Do you trust the necessity of the money that's needed to make whatever you need to make? Or do you trust in the power of God? Remember. So we're going to look at five things that are essential to the practicing of the Sabbath. And the first one is to remember. The second, as you move through how God describes the Sabbath, is to keep it holy. What does it look like to take a day off, and when taking a day off, to not aimlessly rest, but to rest God-centeredly? What does it mean to rest with God being at the very center of your rest? Rest with focus. Now again, I would be the first to say, you work hard, you work five days a week, possibly at your vocation, and then on Saturday you're working, trying to get other stuff done that you couldn't get done during the five days a week, and so you're working then. And then you look at Sunday, and you're like, well, I have church, and I have this, but maybe I can put this involved. And some of you have non-traditional jobs where you're on this amount of time, and you're off this amount of time, and it's exhausting, and it's weird hours, and it's all this crazy stuff. And so what is the point and I think the point of Sabbath is to remember and then keep it holy so that when you rest, you allow yourself to focus on the presence of God. Now for some, that may mean in our culture, with our time, with your particular vocation, it may mean that you are able to come to a church and to worship and to rest and to put Him as the focus, but it may not mean that. And so what you have to ask yourself is not the legalism of keeping the Sabbath, but the reality and the practicality in your life, how do I remember it, and then how do I keep it holy? The next then is frequency. And the Bible is very clear on the frequency, and again, the point is for you not to get all legalistic about it, but the point is regularity. And the Bible's clarity of frequency is this, one out of seven every seven. Six days on, one day off. Let one day out of seven demonstrate that all land and all animals and all raw materials and all breath and strength and thought and emotion and everything come from God. Let man look to God in leisure one day out of seven for the blessing that is so elusive to the affairs of our world. That is the point of six days on, one day on. God created a re rhythm from the beginning of six days on, one day off. He set himself up as the example. And as you get into the law, the land would go for six years and rest on the seventh. Everything was part of this type of rhythm. You guys know it. When you work graveyard shifts, I've been one that has to work those super early morning shifts. When you get your body off those cycles, it is hard. You can still be good at your job, but you're still messed up. And so God is asking us as his people not to not take any job that has weird hours. That's legalism. But he's saying to find the rhythm in your life that allows you frequency allows you highlighting him and not being so exhausted that you can't do anything. Relationships, friendships, time alone, all of those things. How are you working that into the rhythm of your life? The first was remember, the second was keep it holy, the third was frequency, and the fourth, this one's really fun. It is not to be manipulated. Now, in the Western culture in which we live, we have found all kinds of loopholes when it comes to the Sabbath. When it comes to the Sabbath and loopholes, not to be manipulated means this. During this day of focus, you aren't using others to accomplish your desired goals. So you may be taking a day off, but when you read in chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, it says you have your manservants and your maidservants and your animals. They're all working to their fingers to the bone, but you're taking a day off. They're doing all the work that you want to get accomplished, but you're taking the day off. And what God says to us in His Word is it's not to be manipulated. And here's a great example. 
let's look at the Chick-fil-A business model. All right? If you look at the Chick-fil-A business model, all of you know that Chick-fil-A is not open on Sundays. They're not open on Sundays for a belief in the Sabbath. That as Chick-fil-A was started as a company, they wanted to stay steadfast to the Sabbath. So I'm going to give you some facts about Chick-fil-A. In the fiscal year of 2009, so some of these facts are, um, they're actually less in 2009 because um, Chick-fil-A is continuing to grow astronomically over the last four years. But in the fiscal year of 2009, the average revenue for a single store, so if you go to Chick-fil-A at Elkhorn, that single store, the average revenue is $2.13 million. See, okay, so for the year, the average revenue is $2.13 million, which means, and Excuse me, you can do the math, but which means they bring in roughly about $6,826 a day, six days a week. So, $6,800 every day, Monday through Saturday, is what a single Chick-fil-A store brings in. Which means that by not being open on Sunday, each store is sacrificing $355,000 a year of revenue. So but by not being open one day a week, each store is sacrificing $355,000. Now, that seems like a big number, and I thought it was a big number when I did this whole thing. But then I looked at how many stores are Chick-fil-A currently, 2012. There's 1,615 stores, Chick-fil-A stores, times $300 and $55,000 of yearly revenue, which means, as a company, to observe the Sabbath, they are sacrificing, look at this number, $573,325,000 as a company to be closed on Sunday. $573 million. Where is their value? How did Chick-fil-A start? And I'm not putting Chick-fil-A on a throne. You know, they probably have their own baggage. But as you think about the point of Sabbath, it's not to be manipulated. Look in our culture how that number translates to this world. Can't go to Chick-fil-A on Sunday. It's a multi-million dollar sacrifice. It's unbelievable. And so as you look at your life, how are you trying to manipulate the system? When you seek your blessing in God, rather in the products of human labor, you honor His holiness as the greater wealth. The fifth thing that the Sabbath represents is this. Not only do we remember, not only do we keep it holy, not only should we put ourselves in a rhythm of frequency, it's not to be manipulated, but we are following God's example. Now, why did God rest on the seventh day? Is it because he was tired? It's because he had to catch his breath? Kind of got exhausted that... 5K was really hard. God's rest wasn't for recuperation. God's rest was for exaltation. God's rest was to step back and to see the world in which he created and to just be in awe. And as you think about resting and following God's example, do you recognize what God has blessed and made holy, and do you just stand back in awe? Do you take the time to not take your kids from this activity to this activity to this activity to this activity to so stuff their schedules with things that you yourself could not handle, but somehow you think they can, and never pause to just look at them and say, wow, you are such an amazing gift of God. Pausing, stepping back in awe. 
Do you do that in your relationships? Do you do that with those whom you're closest with? Do you do that with people whom you're not the closest with, but your neighbor, you're just like, man, I'm really glad that you're my neighbor. Do you just pause and see what God is doing around you? To end this evening, the question that I want you to be left with when it comes to what are essential to practicing the Sabbath are the same questions that were relevant to prayer. Which area is your most consistent hurdle when it comes to the discipline of Sabbath? Where do you find you excel and where do you find that you don't do so well? How will you practically, again, develop habits to overcome the hurdle? What will it look like for you to truly rest? For you to truly understand what God is trying to get his people to understand. That in order to observe the holiness of God, we must stop and we must reflect on his holiness.